Thank you very much for coming. So um, I'm uh, going to talk about uh, uh, proteomics informatics. And this is the first session uh, about protein identification. And uh, so to start with, I'll give a short introduction to proteomics and mass spectrometry, and then go into different aspects of um, how to analyze the raw mass spec data. Uh, and then continue with the uh, main topic of today, the protein identification, which can be done in several different ways, either searching uh, a database of protein sequences or a library of uh, uh, mass spectra, or just uh, do the novel sequencing without any other support, just the mass, uh, mass spectra. And finally, I'll talk about how to test the significance of the results. So that is how much can be uh, really trust our results. So um, I'm sh sure you all know that why proteomics is important. I just thought I'll show one motivating example here. So this uh, graph shows on the uh, x-axis the, uh, the difference in the uh, amount of proteins in two different cancer cell lines. And uh, the y-axis shows uh, the, uh, 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 the, uh, the, geno the genome duplication, in the, uh, how the genome uh, copy number is different in the two cell lines. So what we see that there is actually very little correlation. Um, and uh, there is plenty of uh, proteins that uh, are uh, upregulated even though the copy number uh, is lower and vice versa, then the copy, a lot of proteins where the copy number is upregulated, but uh, the amount of protein is lower. Uh, and if you look at one uh, protein complex, the 20S proteasome, I don't know if you can see those, there are uh, red crosses here. Uh, so all the uh, proteins that belong to this protein complex uh, are unchanged in the two cell lines while the copy number uh, varies uh, from uh, being uh, twice as much in one of them to twice as much in the other cell line. Uh, so uh, this shows that definitely for this uh, protein complex, uh, it, the, the regulation is not on the genome level, but on the protein level. And probably in this case, uh, one uh, plausible explanation is that uh, uh, proteins that uh, components that are not in a complex will be degraded. But there could be a lot of other uh, uh, possibilities. So just that uh, to motivate you that proteomics is useful. Um, so what we do in proteomics is that we have a biological system. We take a few uh, samples and uh, we, did, we do experimental design to select these samples. Uh, then we prepare the samples, do some measurements. Usually nowadays these measurements involve mass spectrometry. Um, and then we analyze the data and get information about each sample. Um, and then we integrate information using the, uh, what, uh, the experimental design to get information about the biological system. So uh, what information can we get uh, about the sample? So there are actually only two pieces of information that we can get. One is what does the sample contain and how much. Um, and this uh, first lecture I'm going to talk about uh, how to uh, uh, find out what is in the sample. That is to identify the peptides and proteins. So if we look at sample preparation, uh, there are lots of steps like uh, enrichment, separation of the proteins that you can do. Uh, but then uh, it falls into two main categories. One, either we don't uh, digest the proteins and we analyze the whole proteins. This is called top-down analysis. Or we digest uh, and we do bottom-up. And uh, this time I'm mainly going to talk about bottom-up. Uh, and uh, one reason could, because that has been so far much more successful um, and uh, the problem is that proteins are 
often uh, very difficult to handle. Um, and mass spectrometers are not optimized, usually, most of them, to analyze proteins well. But even, uh, it's been said that even the worst behaving protein, when you digest it into peptides, there is at least one peptide that uh, behaves well. So mass spectrometry. Uh, so the basic uh, uh, schematic of mass spectrometry is that you have an ion source, a mass analyzer, and a detector. And there are ma uh, many different types of ion sources, but for uh, uh, proteomics, it's mainly two, moldy and electrospray, that are used. There are also many mass analyzers, uh, the quadrupoles, ion light, time of light, and so on. And these can also be combined in different ways, uh, as we will see later. Uh, so out from the detector comes then a mass spectrum. So a mass spectrum is you have mass with charge on the x-axis and intensity on the y-axis. And so what we measure is mass with charge always. Uh, because the mass analyzer uses different combination of electrical and magnetic fields uh, to separate. Uh, the, the peptides, so we always need charge uh, to, to be able to do that. So uh, one uh, simple mass spectrometer that uh, has been quite useful and usually combined with uh, moldy is the time of light. So here we have the sample plate, the uh, spot, the, our sample uh, embedded in the matrix, and then we shine a laser on it. And then we place this uh, sample plate on high voltage. And so that all the uh, ions that are created here uh, will be accelerated, uh, usually to a, a grid that's uh, at ground. Uh, so, so all the uh, ions with, at the same charge will get the same energy. And then we measure the time it takes them to fly down to the detector. And uh, usually, I mean, so the, fa the small, ion, the small peptides will come first, and the, uh, the, the, big, the bigger the protein, the slower it will fly down the tube. And there is some spread here, uh, because uh, the initial velocity distribution here is not zero, but uh, you will have some of the ions of the same type going a little faster, some a little slower. Uh, so you will get some spreads, which means that uh, uh, you will have uh, wider peaks. So one way to get around this is to uh, turn uh, the ions around in a mirror. So here we have, uh, so we slow them down in, a, uh, in an electrical field, uh, and then they come out again, and then we have the detector over here. So what happens here is that one ion that goes a little faster to start with uh, will go a little deeper into the mirror uh, and then the ones that go slower. So we get a much better uh, focusing of the uh, ions of the same type. So uh, then, as I said before, one can uh, combine uh, different mass analyzers. So here we have a configuration where we have an ion source, first one mass analyzer, and then in between we uh, can fragment our peptides and then we have another mass analyzer and detector. Um, so again here, uh, the result is still uh, a mass spectrum with mass to charge and intensity uh, is what we measure. So one very popular device uh, that uh, has been used a lot is called a triple quadrupole because these three elements are uh, quadrupole fields. Um, so, and then what we do here is the fragmentation is achieved by uh, having a gas which the peptides collide with and give some internal energy so that they will uh, fragment. So the diff there are a few different ways to operate this. So one, you can just measure the uh, the mass of the peptides. So uh, here you use the first anal analyzer just as a uh, focusing device. So you let all the uh, wide range of mass to charge ratios through. You don't have fragment here. 
and the second mass analyzer, you uh, scan the mass range. So as a function of time, you will have uh, different uh, mass to charges coming out. So you will uh, get the mass vector uh, of the peptides themselves. The second way is to uh, select just a small sliver uh, out of the uh, mass to charge range, and then now have the gas uh, to fragment in the fragmentation chamber, um, and then uh, scan the second mass analyzer. So here now we will get the uh, fragment spectrum. Um, then there's one third uh, way to do it, is that where we scan both uh, the first mass analyzer uh, and second one, and we have a constant mass to charge ratio uh, between them. So now what we're looking for is a, a loss, uh, a neutral loss, so a neutral molecule that uh, falls off the peptides. So this can, for example, be used as uh, with, uh, to, to find modified peptides. So we, don't, uh, we just want to find all the phosphor peptides, for example. Phosphor, the, phosphor peptide, uh, the phosphorylation is a very labile modification, so it will, uh, it will fall off. And then, so if we have uh, the uh, mass difference set here to that, then we can find all the fossil peptides. Okay, okay so uh, there are a few different co uh, dissociation techniques. Uh, I mentioned collision activated dissociation. So here we have uh, a gas in a chamber and uh, have uh, lots of collisions. Um, and so here we have the peptide backbone, and usually the fragmentation for collision activated dissociation happens uh, at the peptide bond. So we get what, according to nomenclature, is B and Y ions. And we'll, I'll, I'm going to talk quite a lot about B and Y ions later. Then for, there is a, a newer uh, technique called electron transfer dissociation where we have uh, a reactive gas that transfers an electron uh, and then uh, it creates a radical of the peptides that will then uh, fragment because uh, of the uh, added energy. So uh, these two uh, techniques are quite complementary. Uh, you can uh, access, you can get different types of fragmentation. So sometimes it might be worth uh, doing both uh, on a certain sample. So uh, the differences are that collision activated works very well for low charge, uh, usually 2 plus. Um, ETD needs more charge um, and uh, usually uh, higher uh, uh, 3, 4, 5 uh, charges is much better. Uh, collision activated works for uh, short peptides. Uh, it does not work when you uh, get a little bit bigger peptides. Uh, ETD on the other hand works quite well even for uh, smaller proteins. And uh, the, uh, but you need to have high charge. That's very important. So uh, collision activated uh, dissociation breaks uh, it, it's very sequence dependent. So the, uh, the weak bonds uh, break, but uh, other, so you get uh, some uh, amino acid pairs get very good fragmentation, others uh, you don't get anything at all. And ETD has a much more uniform fragmentation. And then just one thing that here you get preferred uh, fragmentation n terminal to proline, and here you. Uh, on Italy, you don't get internal proline. <coughs> so, uh, one thing that one usually does uh, when one does uh, the when one has many combined uh, uh, mass analyzers is that one does uh, liquid chromatography in front. So, because samples often are quite complex, even if uh, some enrichment has been done. So uh, after digestion, the peptides are separated, uh, and there is a, a time dimension that's introduced. So uh, at each time point, 
uh, a few peptides come into dinosaurs, and it can be quite a lot, even though it's separated. And then one does the uh, mass spectrometry. So here we get a whole uh, collection of, uh, of different uh, uh, mass spectra. And we can, of course, uh, do different combinations. So we can sometimes measure just the peptide mass that comes out, sometimes fragment. And uh, we can switch the different parts of this on and off. So uh, since we can do this switching, we can do uh, one way of doing the data acquisition is data independent. So here we just decide uh, before we do the experiment, we are interested in a few peptides. Um, and this can be quite a lot, that can probably be up to 100, you know, a few hundred sometimes. But in this case, I'm just exemplifying with three. So uh, here we take uh, measure the peptide masses that are coming off the column. Um, and we're interested in the, the to measure uh, what's happening uh, uh, for these peptide masses that's indicated with an arrow. But in this case, so we do three MSMS spectra at these positions, even though, as you see, there's no signal at this point. Then at next time point, we do the same. Again, uh, we do uh, fragmentation of these three. But in this case now, uh, at this arrow, there is some signal. And then we continue. There's more of this thing, but still nothing here. Uh, then this signal is starting to go away, but here this one is starting to come, and so on. So, but you see, we've been doing fragmentation all through at this position, even though we didn't get any signal. Um, so, so we had uh, a, a hypothesis from the beginning that we would have uh, a signal there, but uh, that didn't turn out. But these two we got. So the, the, the advantage of this is that you, you get much better sensitivity since you can uh, fo spend more time on acquiring data of the, uh, the, the peptides that you're interested in. Then the opposite way is to do data dependent. So here you uh, get, obtain the mass spectrum of the peptide masses, and then you have a program that uh, quickly goes through and detects the peaks. And one way of operating this would be to take one MS and then followed by 10 MS MS, for example. So we, we take the 10 most intense peaks here uh, that we fragment. Then, after that, we take another MSMS, but since uh, if we have a fast uh, mass spectrometer, we'll be able to uh, get a lot of data um, that uh, even within the uh, time that one peptide eludes. Uh, so uh, the next uh, spectrum will be very similar. Uh, so it would be ways to uh, try to do MSMS again on the most intense peaks. So what it does is that it uh, creates an exclusion list. So it takes these that it has fragmented and says that, OK, I'm not going to fragment them for another minute or so. Uh, because it's probably, <coughs> otherwise, uh, I won't have time to uh, look at the more, uh, uh, the less intense piece. OK, so uh, now a, a very popular but quite complex uh, mass spectrometer is shown here. I'll show the different parts. So this is called, this is a, a, a combination of linear uh, ion trap and the orbit trap. So one can use it in different modes. Either one can use it. So this is usually used with electrospray, not always, but usually. Um, so here we uh, have the linear ion trap part that we can use to measure peptide masses. So this will give uh, uh, low accuracy masses, uh, probably 1 to 2 Dalton accuracy usually. Um, or uh, we can also uh, fragment, in this case with uh, collision activated dissociation or electron transfer dissociation. And it, in this case we do the fragmentation and then we uh, measure the, the fragments with the same mass analyzer. So here we get uh, very quickly, we get uh, fragment mass spectra. So we can probably, in uh, uh, 
in two and a half seconds get, have time to uh, fragment 10 peptides and get decent spectra. Um, and, but also the uh, fragment masses will be probably 0.5 Dalton, so not uh, quite low uh, accuracy. Then we can use the orbit trap. So here now, the linear ion trap, we just use as a focusing device, and we measure the masses in the, uh, of the peptides in the orbit trap. And here we get uh, very good uh, uh, mass accuracy, usually less than uh, one, uh, we can get uh, one, less than one ppm. Then we can also do fragmentation uh, over here. And this is uh, also collision activated dissociation. It's called higher energy collision, uh, collisional dissociation. And this gives, uh, even though it's still uh, collisional, since we put more energy in, it will give slightly uh, different fragmentation. And it works very well for, uh, uh, for, frag uh, for uh, uh, phosphopeptides, for example. Uh, and the other difference is that here we measure the uh, fragment masses in the orbit trap. So again, we get very high mass accuracy. So then, uh, during the LC, we can use, we can uh, combine different, uh, these different, uh, and switch between all these different uh, uh, possibilities uh, in a data-dependent way. And this is just uh, showing the actual uh, schematic of the actual device. Here's the electrospray source. We have some uh, lenses to the focus the ion beam. Uh, and then we have a, a, a quadrupole uh, just also to focus and to lose as little uh, as possible on the way in. And then we have the ion trap, uh, the, again, more lenses, the, the C trap that will just distribute either the ions to the orbit trap or the uh, HCD collision cell. So getting back to what mass spectra look like. So for one, as I said, they need to be, the peptides and proteins need to be charged uh, to be able to analyze. So one difference between molding and electrospray is that electrospray, for uh, electrospray gives more charges. So typical peptide uh, in molding would have one, one plus, and maybe there is a small two plus. Um, on the other hand, in electrospray, you usually have two, three charges uh, uh, is the most probable. And so what we, so to calculate the, uh, the, M over the mass to charge, uh, we take the peptide mass, so we add the amino acid residues and then the mass of water to get the peptide mass, and then we add uh, a number of protons, so uh, depending on how many charges. So we, we add a proton. The, this is an old uh, moment. Uh, it's uh, eight stands for hydrogen, but it's really the, the proton mass that should be. It uh, didn't matter earlier, but now we can measure the masses so well that it doesn't matter whether one takes the proton or the uh, hydrogen mass. Uh, then for proteins, with mold, we get a few more uh, charges. And for electrospray, we get a lot more charges. If we zoom in and look at a peptide, uh, we see that a peptide doesn't have just one peak, but it has a distribution of peaks. So if we go from uh, 1,000, this, is, this distribution changes uh, as you go up in mass. And what this is, is that the first peak is the one that contains carbon-12, nitrogen-14, oxygen-16, and so on. Um, and then all these have, um, uh, all these atoms have naturally occurring isotopes <coughs> that are uh, around in a small percentage. And carbon-13 is the biggest contributor, but also the others uh, contribute. So we get this, uh, shifted by, uh, by one Dalton, and then depending on the charge, the, uh, the M over Z uh, difference will change. 
So uh, if we only uh, look at carbon 12 and carbon 13, then we can just use a binomial distribution to, to estimate the, the shape of this. Uh, but that is, it's a first uh, order approximation, but uh, to really get it uh, accurate, we should take all of the uh, atoms into account. And of course, this is very nice that we can use this to uh, to see if we really have a peptide there. Uh, since we have a signature not only that we measure a mass, but we will also measure the, uh, the distribution. Uh, so we can see, for example, if the, uh, we have a mass of 1,000, but the distribution looks like this, we know that there is a mixture from there of two uh, overlapping peaks. So if you look at the distribution, so this is, these dots are all the uh, calculated, uh, uh, the, the ratio between the uh, one carbon 13 peak divided by the monastopic uh, peak intensity. And this is for all the triptych peptides in yeast. And we see that this, of course, increases linearly. Uh, this quadratically and the, the other isotopes then will, uh, will ri uh, increase very fast. So even if you go to a small protein, you will get uh, many uh, isotopes. And the monoisotopic mass is down here somewhere and it's unobservable. Um, so uh, this of course leads to a problem that we get quite wide peaks <coughs> And we need to be able to resolve these to, to really be, uh, know what's going on in the protein. That's one other reason why it's more advantageous to work with smaller peptides. So another thing is that it's all very good if we don't have any noise in our system, but often we do have noise. So uh, uh, this is the same. Uh, distribution here with different amounts of noise added. And as you see, uh, it's not so easy to uh, to assign peaks if we have a lot of noise. So the way we find peaks is that we, we, we decide on what width of a peak we look for, and this width can of course change for the uh, as a function of uh, mass to charge, but it usually for a certain mass spectrometer we can we know uh, how wide peaks it gives. So what we do is we uh, just find maxima where we just add the intensities for a certain width. Um, so we did, uh, just scan the whole mass spectrum and see where there are maxima. So when we find these maxima, we can then uh, determine the mass to charge, uh, the centroid mass to charge, that is the, uh, the best uh, uh, ma mass to charge that we, a peak would give, the, the most uh, accurate. So that we do simply with the, the weighted uh, average of the, mass, uh, of the mass to charge ratios uh, over the peak weighted by the intensity. <coughs> then when we have noise, of course, we need to uh, decide whether it's something is a peak or whether it's just some uh, fluctuation in the noise. Um, so one way to do this is to estimate the signal in a certain area by calculating the root mean square deviation. So we just take the average intensity over the uh, peak width, and then uh, add the squares of the deviations of the uh, of the intensity, and then uh, divide by the width and uh, take the square root of that. Um, so uh, and then so we can do this over the peaks, and then we can also do it over different regions in the background, um, and then from that just. Uh, divide those two numbers to get the, uh, the signal-to-noise ratio. And then uh, one can uh, set a threshold for which signal-to-noise ratio is acceptable, and then accept those peaks that have higher. Uh. 
So uh, another thing we can do with this, uh, with these isotope clusters, is to determine the charge state if uh, we can separate them. So um, if we have a, a charge of one, the distance will be one. If we have a charge of two, the distance will be 0.5, and 3, 0.33, and so on. Um, so if they're nicely separated like this, we can determine the top charge. If they're a little wider, starting to uh, merge, it's still uh, not difficult to determine the charge. Then here, in this case, it's, uh, it's starting to be difficult and probably not possible. And here, when they merge completely, it's definitely not. So one thing that's very important is that um, if the, the mass spectrometer should be tuned so that it has as good of um, uh, resolution as possible, uh, because one can then uh, resolve, both resolve the peaks and see if there's interference, but also determine the charge which is very helpful. Because otherwise, if we don't know the charge, uh, then we will later on have to uh, assume, uh, I mean, just test, is it one plus, is it two plus, is it three plus, and that adds noise to our analysis. Okay, so uh, now uh, we're gonna go to uh, protein identification. So first by peptide mass fingerprinting. So here now, uh, we do a digestion and then get a peptide mass spectrum. Uh, and so here we measure just the peptide masses. So uh, an example of data uh, from Molditoff in this case. So here is a digestion of a protein, uh, or, or probably of a few proteins, but mainly one protein. Um, and we see that we get lots of uh, uh, peaks. So if you look a little bit closer in this area here uh, and expand that, we see that we uh, recognize the isotope distributions. And then we see that it's quite a lot of peaks uh, everywhere, even uh, at the small intensity. If we zoom in here, we see that we get uh, two peaks uh, that look like they have a, a, a nice isotope distribution. So it, Another case, if you look in this area here, where we have just a little bit what looks like noise, you see that there's actually quite uh, a lot of uh, peaks there that could be interesting. So if you zoom into this area, you see that there are, uh, it's definitely worth trying to go down as far as possible down into the noise. So uh, the, the data, I showed you, it showed the measurement of the masses of many uh, triptych peptides for a protein. So if we just uh, consider one triptych peptide to start with, and see in human, uh, so here is the triptych peptide mass, and then we just count the number of triptych peptides when we take the whole human proteome and uh, uh, digest it according to the rules of trypsin uh, in, in the computer now. Um, we see how many peptides match. So then what, what, uh, we see that depending on what the mass accuracy of the device is, we get less and less peptides. And at some uh, around uh, 0.1 uh, ppm we reach the limit. And uh, so this limit, uh, even if we get better mass accuracy, it doesn't change, uh, it doesn't decrease the number of peptides that match. And that's because here we have uh, reached the level of elemental composition. Uh, so that's all. So we measure and we can determine the elemental composition and we can't do better than that. Um, so if we go in here and look at, we have a triptych peptide mass of 2000 at one, dole, uh, one ppm. Uh, if we see what, so this, is, this graph is an average. So here we see that we get uh, peptides with uh, one, uh, two, three, four, I mean up to maybe uh, eight uh, peptides that match uh, a certain mass. So uh, it's, it's quite remarkable. We go from uh, many thousands of peptides and that's by measuring one mass, we can go down to a few uh, possibilities. And 
then of course a smaller genome like yeast, um, then we can uh, use, most of the time actually, there's only one peptide matching. Uh, but uh, then here we haven't taken into account uh, modifications, so this is not uh, completely uh, uh, true. So in the, in the case of modification, there will be many more. But on the other hand, in peptide mapping, we do measure many peptide masses. Okay, so what do we do? So this is the experiment that we do. And then the step here, going from the mass spectrum to identify proteins, uh, we have to first find the peaks, as we discussed before, preferably determine their charge, and then uh, the isotope. So we only want to use the monoisotopic mass for, uh, for searches. And then we do the uh, database search. So uh, this is the experiment. The main uh, step that we have to uh, simulate in a computer is the digestion. So what we do is we take a sequence database, we pick one protein, we digest it according to the same rules, and almost everyone nowadays uses the trypsin, so that uh, cleaves that uh, lies in an arginine. Uh, so we take all the peptide masses and create a theoretical mass spectrum in this case. And observe that here we don't know anything about intensities. So here we measure intensities. Uh, but here we just have the sequence to start with. So we don't know anything about intensities. Um, so we, 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 in essence, throw away the intensity information. Then we compare the measured mass spectrum with the theoretical. And we score, calculate the score, and we test the significance. Uh, then we repeat this for each protein in the database. Uh, so uh, there are many ways to score. And the, the, the simplest way is just to calc uh, count the number of matching peaks, number of peaks that have uh, the same mass within some mass tolerance. <coughs> so uh, that, that works very well when the data is good. But uh, uh, a lot of times when the data is uh, borderline, it's not so good. And it will only, at random, report a very large protein, because it's the chance of randomly matching a large protein is much bigger. So uh, all the, the search algorithms that people use have different solutions for how to get around this problem. And oh, so then in the end we get a list of identified proteins. So this is one uh, search algorithm that has been around for a long time. It's called Profound, and it's available on the web. Um, <coughs> so uh, you select a database. So there are many different uh, databases. So one, the one that we're using here is uh, NCBI's non-redundant database. Uh, it's uh, it contains a lot of sequences. The, the problem might be that it's, uh, it's non-redundant, but non-redundant in this case only means that uh, you don't have the exact the same sequence once, but you can have uh, different people can submit things, maybe with an error, and then it will uh, uh, show up as separate entries. Uh, so in this case, we don't search the whole database. We just uh, select one part of it, which is uh, uh, Xenopus levis in this case, because that's what we know the sample is from. Um, and definitely, if you know what your sample is, uh, don't search a larger database than that, um, to a certain limit. I mean, you should search, if, the, if you have a, a genome sequence, so you know that most of the proteins are in the database, then you should definitely choose just uh, those sequences. But if you search uh, for a species that uh, is not, doesn't have a genome sequence, then it's maybe better to uh, search for, like for example, let's say uh, you work with uh, uh, a mammal that uh, does not have a genome sequence, then you can search all mammalian sequences and so on. So, uh, but there are more and more genome sequence. Then here you can limit 
the, the protein mass and the protein PI. Uh, in general, I don't re recommend limiting this too much because it's uh, the the sequence in the databases are not always the, the actual mature uh, gene product. So uh, there is uh, uh, some additional processing that's often not uh, annotated. So uh, one should. Uh, leave this quite wide. Then you can define enzyme uh, and modifications. And finally, enter the, uh, in this case, the mon we enter the monoisotopic masses into this box and select mass tolerance and uh, then we just search. And the result is a list of, um, of proteins that uh, start with the most probable protein at top and then go down. And it shows something called expectation value that I'm going to get back to a little bit later, but uh, what, it, what this is, it, uh, it shows you what the uh, probability is that this is by uh, this matching occurred by chance. Um, then we have, so we see here that we found one protein with uh, the low expectation value, um, then, uh, and the other ones in the list have much higher expectation values and are probably just random matches. And it also gives you how what percentage of protein it, uh, is covered by peptides observed. So we can uh, click there and see how. So this is a linear representation of the protein sequence. And these are uh, the peptides that are observed. And here is a plot of their mass error. So one thing we see here, there's probably some systematic uh, mass error here that uh, changes with mass that uh, might be worth uh, correcting for. So that uh, it seems like with the linear correction, we will get much better mass accuracy. Um, and then we can get the list of all the peptides and their properties uh, that are that matched. Okay, so then uh, this was now peptide mapping, so I'm going to move on to tandem MS. So as I said before, uh, this is an example of electrospray uh, liquid chromatography MSMS data. So. Uh, we have this now this time axis, and at each time we will collect a, uh, a mass spectrum. So we have so this is actually sliced together uh, all the uh, the signal from the uh, MS1. So that is the, all the peptide masses. So we see we observe a lot of peptides. We can zoom in and see the isotopic distribution. And now again here we have the time axis. So uh, the peak will appear and then disappear, and we have the isotopes here. Then we have uh, also collected, in addition to measuring the peptide masses that are shown here, we've also collected uh, fragment mass spectra, so at each uh, point here we can have a fragment. So this is a much more complex uh, data that is much more difficult to analyze, and also uh, people are trying to visualize it in different ways, but it's often uh, not easy to visualize it really well. So if we return to peptide fragmentation, we have we can get fragmentation usually in, since we use low energy, we get it along the backbone. So. Uh, and in collision-activated dissociations, we get it at the peptide bond, and we create what's called B and Y ions. And these uh, look like uh, this. So if you look at first the Y ion, uh, it uh, is actually the peptide residues. So it looks like the Y ions look like peptides, uh, just with the proton mass uh, on them. And the B ions. Are, uh, so the end of a peptide should be OH here. So it's uh, so it's like a peptide by just missing the uh, OH. 
So we'll, we'll need to use that information later. So then we have, then we talk about identification of a tandem mass spectrum. What we want to do is we want to convert uh, these, these measured masses uh, to a sequence. So we want to uh, annotate as many as possible of the uh, peaks in the spectrum with a sequence. Um, and this is not always such an easy task to do because there's a, often a lot of information missing. So if we take it from the other uh, side, is that let's say we, have, we know the sequence and we want to just uh, confirm that this uh, mass spectrum is uh, fr fragmentation of this sequence. Then we can simply calculate all the B ions and all the Y ions uh, and um, then annotate the spectrum with these. So we see that in this case we have really a, a lot of uh, the fragmentation. So we can go in and for example see that if we fragment between uh, this uh, 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 phenylalanine and uh, uh, leucine uh, then uh, we, have, we get the B ion at 292 and leucine uh, eight, uh, at 875, and those are in the spectrum. So then if we move on to the next one, the uh, fragmentation here, we see that uh, leucine, uh, as we expect, is 113 difference, and we observe that. And then we can go through the spectrum <coughs> and see uh, all the uh, the fragmentation. But this is the easy, since we knew the sequence, we just wanted to confirm that that was correct. Uh, usually what we want to do is we have a, uh, a spectrum with masses, and then we have a list of amino acid masses, and then we take mass differences, and we want to find the sequence that's consist all the sequences that's consistent with the spectrum. So one way of doing this is to plot it in the table. So here are the masses in the uh, in the spectrum. We plot both uh, along there and there, same masses. And then we take the mass differences. And then we see which ones match to uh, an amino acid mass. And we get a few matches. Um, and then we can convert these into amino acids. And then we start here and uh, can read off the sequence. Um, so for example, uh, between the, the 260 and 389, we have uh, 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 glutamic acid. Uh, so then we take 389 and continue and uh, see that there we have an aspartic acid. We have 504 and then continue like this. So uh, we can uh, read off the sequence very nicely in this case. So this is a very good example, of course. Um, it's usually not this uh, nice. So now we have reached the end. So we start again, because there is some missing. Since we have, uh, there are two possible, since we have both B and Y ions, um, we will uh, hopefully get two different uh, sequences that are partially overlapping. Now we uh, run into a little problem. And uh, in the real case, we will run into a lot of problems like this, uh, that there are two possibilities. Uh, but, in, um, but we've used already this mass, the 389, so we can cross this out. So again, we know that it's this. Then we go to next. Again, two possibilities, but again, we can easily resolve that because uh, this peak already belongs to a very nice long series. Um, and then we continue down, and uh, finally, when we're done, uh, so now this is very nice. We got two nice series. Often you get much shorter because there's gaps. Uh, you get uh, several series that you can't put together. But whatever you get here in the end, you try to put it together. And uh, here, in this case, we get a nice stretch. Um, we don't know the ends and we don't know the uh, direction. 
but by also adding in the, uh, the peptide mass, uh, we can see that we find a, an additional mass difference, and then we can put the serum in the end. And here, because B and Y ions are uh, asymmetrical, um, we can say that this was uh, uh, actually a Y ion. And then finally, one more we can set uh, with the B ion where we uh, have to uh, subtract uh, water mass. Uh, we can then finally get the last residue, even though in this case we don't have the mass accuracy to distinguish between uh, 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 lysine and glutamine. So, uh, this example was very good. Usually there are a lot more peaks that are not so useful. There are neutral loss peaks, uh, peptides losing water, uh, and NH3. We have modifications. If we have modifications that we don't expect, then we, uh, it's uh, very problematic. We have background peaks that confuse uh, things. Um, and the biggest problem is probably that we have often incomplete information. And then there's really nothing much we can do. Then we do the novel sequence. <coughs> but there is one uh, very good thing is that now when we have databases of protein sequences, we can instead of doing this, uh, we can match uh, protein sequence database. So here we have the outline of the experiment. And the main step is that that we need to mimic in the computer is the digestion and the uh, fragmentation. So what we do again, we have sequence database, we pick a protein, uh, digest the protein according to the enzyme, the rules, then we pick one peptide from that protein and then uh, take all the fragment masses. So, again, here, uh, we don't know anything about intensity, even though we measure intensity. So we throw that information away. Then we compare uh, and score this. Um, and then we repeat this for all peptides for this protein. And then we repeat it for all the proteins in the database. Uh, so, and then in the end we get uh, a list of identified peptides that we can then assemble into identified proteins. So uh, the, and again here, there are many ways to score this uh, comparison, and people have, uh, uh, there's been many search engines developed that a lot of them are available uh, for free on the internet. So, uh, talking a little bit about scoring. So there are many ways to score. Uh, and so this plot just shows the score on the x-axis and uh, the how many uh, pe uh, peptides get a certain score. So uh, here we have uh, the, the correct peptide sequence. And then here we have a distribution of random matches. So in the case we see here, so this is simply take, uh, treating a mass spectrum as a, uh, as a vector and taking a dot product. We see that this gives a very uh, poor separation between the correct and the random. We want this separation to be as good as possible. Um, so by simply adding one term, so this is the the uh, factorial of the number of B ions times the factorial number of Y ions, we can separate between the uh, correct and the random uh, much better. So it's definitely worth optimizing uh, the, the, the algorithm and uh, trying to get as good of a separation as possible between the, the random and the correct. Uh, so in uh, we will, I will going to get back to this a little bit later, where we will use this uh, random distribution to estimate what uh, the chance is that this is a random uh, match also. So uh, one of the uh, search algorithms uh, is called 
extended and it's also available for free and also for you can download it and install it as open source. Um, again, uh, some of the search parameters are very similar to uh, what we had for peptide mass fingerprinting. So, for example, we choose a database, uh, and uh, here there are some. Uh, we can also, uh, I will get back to this later. Also, we can include uh, a database of where we reverse the, all the sequences. This is a, a quality control step, also to estimate what how good our results are. Um, other parameters, now we have the, the fragment mass error, uh, the mass of the peptide, uh, the mass error of the peptide measure measurement. Um, we can also do signal processing to uh, remove uh, spectra that contain very little information before we do the search so we don't waste time. Um, we can define what type of fragmentation we have. Then also protein modifications. And here there are two types of modification. One is what's called a complete modification, uh, which uh, is something that on every, uh, let's say, usually for cysteine, uh, in the sample uh, preparation process, you uh, alkaline the cysteine. So uh, uh, here uh, we've uh, chosen that all the cysteines are uh, uh, carbon demethylated. Um, and uh, so th that's on every time it finds a cysteine, it will add that mass. But then there is the uh, potential modifications, which then it will, if, it ha if you define potential modification, it will try with and without uh, that modification. And of course, this will add a lot of time and also a lot of noise um, if you uh, choose a lot of these. Um, so what uh, usually, Almost always people uh, search with uh, oxidative methionine because that happens a lot in the sample preparation process. Um, but otherwise, they only add potential modifications here if they are looking for a specific uh, modification, like, for example, uh, phosphorylation. Uh, but then one thing that Xtandem has is that it does a refinement. Um, of the search. So it does uh, first the search with uh, the, the defined parameters, uh, but then you can do a refinement. So any protein that it finds in the first round, uh, you can go on and uh, test for more modifications. And this is also something several uh, research engines do. So here in the second round, one can add, uh, one can actually, you can do four rounds here, you can add more and more modifications. and. Here you don't uh, take a hit on the on the statistics and not on the search speed so much. Uh, you can also include uh, here unanticipated cleavage. So even if you use uh, trypsin, um, sometimes you get enzymatic activity from trimetrypsin from uh, or uh, just uh, uh, from seemingly cleavage at random sites. So the way this works, you have a lot of sequences to start with. You do the search. Uh, then you get just a few sequences. You add on a few more modifications. Um, and then uh, you add on more modifications. And then in the third round, maybe you add on uh, point mutations. Uh, and this way, you uh, the good thing is that you do uh, you can find all these point mutation modifications, but you don't have to uh, take the time for the search, and also you don't have a problem with all the noise issues. So an example of search results. Um, here we see a list of uh, proteins again, uh, and how the ex expectation value. So here we get very low expectation values. So these are longer, uh, the longer than the expectation values. And here we see the uh, coverage. So this is, of course, this albumin. And uh, we can uh, see cover the red uh, are the peptides that we observed. 
So one now there's more and more uh, spectra being accumulated and uh, stored in databases. So uh, one thing that uh, Xtanen does is that it queries the database. Um, and it shows here that uh, something almost 140,000 uh, times people have observed albumin um, in this database. And this, the result here is uh, uh, number 31 in quality. So it's uh, so this is very nice data set that if you if you rank very low on this, you probably have uh, should optimize your experiment. Um, so that's a very nice feedback that you can say that how well you're doing compared to others. Then we can look at it. Uh, one can go in and look at details of the uh, of the sequence. Uh, we can look at the different peptides. So um, here uh, it will show the the expectation of the uh, peptide. So so. Uh, with, MS, uh, with tandem spectrometry, what we identify is peptides, and then we uh, assemble these into proteins. Um, and the, here uh, it indicates that uh, these residues have been modified in different ways. Um, something also uh, for quality is that it can show you, it, it shows you uh, how many times other people have observed this peptide. Uh, so if you see, uh, identify a protein and you see that other people have observed uh, these peptides often, then you can feel much more confident uh, that you've done, uh, 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 it's, it's correct. Another uh, sort of quality thing is the, it shows how many charges your, uh, that you observed, and how many possible basic residues there are. So uh, charges can sit on, uh, usually on the uh, lysine arginine or the N-terminal or sometimes histidine. Um, so you can see that you shouldn't have more charges than uh, possible uh, sites. So there are a lot of small uh, sort of for information that can be used for quality control. And then finally, you can look at the uh, actual match between the uh, fragment mass spectrum and the peptide. So here, there's a color coding that shows uh, the Y ions um, and in red and the B ions uh, in blue, and then different neutral losses in uh, uh, different colors. So for example, uh, uh, loss of NH, neutral loss of NH3 from the Y ion is orange. And then it shows the same information on, uh, placed on the uh, peptide sequence, where uh, it shows what's the evidence for a fragmentation between a pair of amino acids. Uh, and the, the length of these bars correspond to the intensity of the ions in the spectrum. So uh, one thing we can uh, look at is how many masses, uh, how many peaks do we need, uh, fragment masses do we need to identify a, uh, uh, a peptide. So uh, one way of doing this is <coughs> to do simulations. So we, uh, I'm not going to go into detail, but we created synthetic spectra that we uh, searched many times. So we vary the number of fragment masses uh, and then we, uh, we did a sampling so, and then did the search and calculated what's the chance of success. So if you have very few fragment masses, you'll never succeed to identify anything. And if you have a lot, it will always work. But then there's a transition here in between. And uh, so we define that when we have 50% chance of success, that's the critical number of fragment masses. So one thing we can observe then is that if we change the, the precursor mass, mm, we see that small peptides are slightly more difficult to, so we get a shift of this curve towards more number of uh, fragment masses. And that's uh, uh, not so surprising because there are many more 
uh, small peptides, and uh, uh, so we, we will get um, uh, a problem with the uh, uh, statistics. And also, the other problem with small peptides is that they're short, so the chance of getting a lot of fragment ions is uh, not so high. So uh, if we improve the parent mass accuracy, so the measurement of the actual peptide mass, uh, then we can gain quite a bit. So uh, here is going from uh, the black circles are one Dalton. If we improve it so that it's 0 0.01 Dalton, we can we, get, we need a few uh, fragment uh, mass science left uh, to do this. And this is also one can understand because the if we have we we can we restrict on the pet, uh, parent mass. So uh, there are few peptides that uh, uh, that can match that. So there are few that we need to match to the uh, fragments. Then uh, the same, then above a certain threshold, the fragment mass error is very important. But low, below a threshold, it, uh, main, uh, it, it's not that important. And then this is mainly because uh, what we measure in the fragment, we need to determine which amino acid it is. But we, uh, when we reach that level, it doesn't improve uh, more than that. We can also add quite a bit of background. So uh, the, the, if we compare, uh, when there is no background peaks, and half the peaks in the spectrum are background, there is a, a almost uh, no shift. Uh, so we don't need, uh, we can tolerate quite a bit of background. If we, uh, if 80 percent, so uh, four out of uh, five peaks in the spectrum are background, then uh, things get a little worse. And uh, remember, this is for uh, precursor mass of one Dalton and fragment mass of 0.5 Dalton. Then, if we improve uh, the the, uh, the fragment mass in this case, uh, then we have background peaks. Then the, that makes a very big difference. Um, then, if we get to the modification, so as I said before, if we uh, looking for uh, phosphorylated peptides, uh, we need to define that uh, as uh, a potential modification. Because most of the potential uh, phosphorylation sites, like, uh, so phosphorylation can be on serum, threonine, and tyrosine. Uh, most of them are not going to be phosphorylated. <coughs> so we need to test all the possibilities. Uh, but again, uh, in the, for these settings, we only need maybe one more fragment ion to, uh, to be on average to uh, identify fossil peptides. Okay, so as I mentioned before, we started to collect uh, mass spectra. Uh, and the idea with that is one thing we can use it for is confirmation. Uh, if something is very similar to what other people have observed, it's, uh, uh, one can uh, probably trust it more. Uh, but also the other thing is that we can do, use these to make spectrum libraries to, uh, for protein identification. So here, simply we do measurements, and then we go through the library and see which uh, spectrum it matches to best. And the nice thing here is that we do actually use the intensity information uh, in the in the matching, and also we only match uh, to peptides that have been observed, which can be a disadvantage if you look for new things. But uh, the, the database is starting to get so big that uh, it's very unusual that you one actually does find new things. Um, especially for things like yeast or human. So, uh, so it's so sort of the database here is much smaller. So we uh, we have a much better chance of uh, uh, getting uh, even for if we have a poor mass spectrum to get a good identification. 
So what, if you look at the uh, characteristics of the spectrum libraries, so uh, we have a distribution of peptide length that peaks around uh, the 12 amino acids and then goes down. So this is all uh, triplet peptides. That, um, th there's only a large enough uh, uh, collection for triplet peptides. Uh, and protein coverage, so, uh, uh, high, uh, larger proteins, it's around 10%, and then for small proteins, it uh, goes uh, quite high up to only 40% uh, of uh, the, uh, the part, which fraction of the protein we, we have observed in the library. Then, there's starting to be quite a lot of spectra, so uh, for human, we have more than a million, uh, tandem mass spectra uh, that from uh, 270,000 peptides, so that's uh, on the average 3.7% uh, uh, redundancy. Um, so as you see that this is starting to be uh, quite useful. And then if we go down the list for other mammals, there's uh, also quite a bit uh, of uh, uh, and also for uh, <coughs> other, uh, like yeast, C. elegans, and Arabidopsis, and so on. Um, so, uh, so far, it's still actually not being used so much, uh, but I think it's it's uh, ready to um, to use. The, the problem is, of course, that if it's not in the uh, library, you won't find it. It's the same problem as when you do the sequence database search. Um, if your sequence is not in there, you won't find it. That's why uh, the normal sequencing is, uh, for some uh, projects, uh, necessary. Okay, so what do we do when we do a spectrum library search? Uh, it's quite simple. We have a library spectrum. So here, uh, in the library spectrum, we have five masses observed, uh, and in this case, just out of 25. And in the test spectrum, we also have five out of uh, 25 possible masses. And four out of these match. So now we need to calculate what the probability is. So we can uh, do this pretty easily with a hypergeometrical model. So we have 25 possible MO3 values, five peaks, and five are matched. Uh, four are matched. Uh, so we can uh, get calculate the probability for that. And of course, real mass spectra are much uh, larger. So let's say we have 1,000 possible uh, MOZ values and 20 peaks that we compare. And actually, 20 peaks is that what we decided on when we are uh, making these libraries. So we see that we get p values that are very low. Um, and but these, remember, these are p-values, and we do multiple testing that we will need to correct for. And I'm, I'm going to uh, come back to that uh, later. So again, simply what we do, we have an exponential mass spectrum. We just search a library and find one. And uh, then uh, find the best one. And one example of that so is here. This is a query spectrum, library spectrum. Um, and you see that if you compare the relative intensities, for example, of these two peaks, there is some variation. And uh, that's to be expected. These are two different kinds of mass spectrometer, actually. Uh, but overall, uh, if you use the same kind of mass spectrometer, you definitely get very reproducible results from, uh, from different labs. And even different types of mass spectrometers gives roughly the same uh, signature. OK, so as I said before, that we need to uh, te uh, test how much we can trust the results. Um, so we will always get random matching, because uh, uh, there is a, we don't measure the masses exactly, and even if we would measure the masses exactly, we would get uh, random matching. Uh, and so we need an objective criterion for uh, to say when we can trust an identification result and when we can't. 
so if we uh, get this, uh, so, so what we need for this is the distribution of scores or false results. So this, we can do this in a few different ways. One is we can do simulations uh, to generate a distribution. So we, we then use properties of the real mass spectra and then to generate an ensemble uh, that are similar and then generate a distribution. That's usually not so uh, practical because it takes too long. Um, another way to do it is to uh, add in a database that is rever has reverse sequences, so or scrambled sequences. Here you will uh, uh, get uh, so so what you see if you get a match to the reverse database, you know that it's not. Uh, real. So you get those that only have false uh, identifications. Um, so, so that's one. And another way to do it is to collect statistics. So here, uh, and using the observation that most of the sequences uh, in the database will give some score, but it will be score from random matching. So we will always get a distribution of random matching. And then hopefully a few, one or more, that are with very high score, that uh, are possibly uh, uh, real uh, matches. So we want to see what, how far away this is. So this actually turns out for, uh, not just for uh, uh, protein identification, but also for BAST and for other, anywhere where you, uh, do some matching and look at the top hits and to see what uh, um, uh, and try see uh, try to identify them. So uh, this turns out to be an extreme value distribution, and the properties of that is that the tail is exponential. Um, so what you can do is uh, you can extrapolate it out to high scores. Uh, to uh, to calculate uh, the expectation value for this, so here uh, you so the expectation that's just the number of uh, sequences that you expect at a certain score. Uh, so then, when it's below zero, you need to uh, extrapolate and uh, uh, to get the values for these outliers. And this actually turns out to be quite a robust method to do it. And this is what's been implemented in both uh, Xtandem and Trofund. Another nice thing that expect, uh, oh, yeah, so, so simply what you do is you have your tandem mass spectrum, you do the database search, get a list of candidates, and then use this list of candidates to uh, generate a distribution of random and false identifications. Um, then you do the extrapolation and calculate the uh, expectation value of the top candidates. So one thing that you also can use the expectation uh, values for is to uh, calculate overall quality of the data set. Um, and this is good. One can plot so-called row diagrams. So the property of uh, expectation values if you have random matching uh, is that it should uh, uh, go down exponentially. So if you, uh, if you count, if you have a large data set and you count uh, what, how, many, uh, how many matches you get to the certain expectation value. So for random matching, uh, this row uh, as we define it should be equal to minus i. So that is, it should go, so if we have rho here and uh, uh, log, log of the expectation value here, then it should go down uh, on the diagonal. So that, that's just the simple property of the expectation value if we have random matching. If you have non-random matching, so here, for example, we have three different data sets with different quality. We get deviation from this diagonal. And we immediately can tell that uh, the data set that uh, deviates from the diagonal first is the one with the best quality, because we get 
an enrichment of uh, uh, high expectation values. So we see that we can rank these three data sets uh, high quality, medium, and low quality. We can also use this to just optimize parameters. So this is now the same data set, but with different sets of parameters. So we see that here, we re uh, with the black circles, we really not succeeded in choosing the parameters because we don't, uh, it's like random matching. But here we've optimized the parameter settings so that we get very good matching. Okay, so as a summary, so I hope I have given you a, an overview of protein identification <coughs> of uh, the, uh, how to do the novel sequencing, what the issues are, uh, how to do search, search sequence databases and spectral libraries. So just uh, quickly, so the uh, advantage of the novel sequencing is that you don't need to depend on any database or anything. You just have the spectrum and the randomized masses, uh, but it's often difficult because you uh, there is missing information, um, and even if uh, there is no not missing information, there is a lot of uh, 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 confounding information there. So, uh, searching sequence collections is uh, the the most common way that people do protein identification, uh, and it's because there is. Uh, so many genome sequenced, so we will uh, we, we can take advantage of that. And <coughs> here uh, we can we use those uh, databases to fill in the missing information uh, in the spectrum. So it's uh, sometimes you need surprisingly little information to be able to identify uh, uh, peptides. And uh, but. Uh, if you don't have your protein sequence in a database, you will not find it. Um, then finally, searching spectrum libraries is uh, a very good way to go, and it will probably uh, go more and more towards that. For small molecules, uh, it started out with um, that people were searching database a long time ago. And then uh, after, uh, as the field matured, uh, there were spectral libraries created, and now uh, all uh, small molecule identification happens with uh, searching uh, spectral libraries. But again, you need to have a lot of spectra to be able to do this. And finally, it's very important to report the significance of the results. And also, I've set up a Google group for proteomics in New York City. If you're interested, please join. It's called Proteomics in New York City. Uh, and uh, then uh, the next workshop was, will be in two weeks on Friday. I'm going to cover protein characterization. And the uh, third and last part will be on uh, protein monetization. Any questions? <coughs>